We've seen blueprints, photographs, laborers, and construction. The planners of various aspects of the camp's development and operation were architects, engineers, businessmen, chemists, managers, and others, and of course, Nazi ideologues and leaders. And Donnie, in his riveting lecture, pointed out that interplay of those uh, Himmler kinds of people, the ideologues and leaders, and those more ordinary kind of people, the uh, engineers and the architects and the managers. When we look at Auschwitz-Birkenau, as with the Shoah overall, we can see on many levels the ordinary, the normal, and the mundane wedded to the extraordinary, the ideological, and the evil, as we've just seen. The very normality and ordinariness of so many of the participants and parts of their jobs has been the source of much research and discussion over the decades since the Shoah. Indeed, at the beginning of his important work, The Nazi Doctors, the psychiatrist and researcher Robert J. Lifton recounts a conversation that he had with Elie Wiesel as Lifton was working on the book. And Wiesel knew what Lifton's research was about, and he asked him, were they, these Nazi doctors, were they beasts when they did what they did, or were they human beings? Lifton answered, they were and are men, which is my justification for studying them and their behavior. To which Wiesel, Wiesel responded, it is demonic that they were not demonic. Some philosophers and other scholars have used dramatic terms to try to grapple with and understand the impact of the Shoah on our world. Terms such as rupture, watershed, tremendum, or an epoch-making event, and other such terms. And it seems that the normal and ordinary aspects of the people involved only add to the disturbing nature of the event. Indeed, since the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and since the Shoah, we live with the terrible knowledge that such things are possible in the course of human events in our world. Indeed, those terms that the various scholars have suggested for understanding the importance of the Shoah point to a world that has changed. It is different since the Shoah, different since Auschwitz, and changed for the worse, they seem to say, as a result of that. Some scholars have pointed to crises of leadership, of the churches, of education, of the academy, and more that have been engendered by the Shoah. Zalman Gradovsky, an ordinary Jew, a member of the Zunderkommando in Birkenau, who did not survive, buried his account of his experiences in the ashes of the crematorium shortly before the camp was liberated by the Soviet army. And he wrote the following. Dear Finder, search every part of the ground. Buried in it are dozens of documents of others and mine, which shed light on everything that happened here. As for us, we have lost any hope of ever reaching the day of liberation. The future will judge us on the basis of this evidence. May the world understand some small part of the tragic world in which we lived. Sixty-five years since the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, three generations in human time, is an opportunity to look back and perhaps to assess and reflect regarding the meaning of that event and where we stand today. And with that in mind, I would like to call on our next three speakers, Ruth Bondi and Professor Albinari and Professor Hobbitel to come up and take their places. The honor I feel to be on the dais with these three people is uh, quite great. We will hear first from uh, Ruth Bondi in Hebrew. The other speakers will speak in English. Ruth Bondi was born in Prague. She is a writer and a translator, a historian. 
She was formerly a prisoner of Terezin, Theresienstadt, and of Auschwitz, and she's a survivor of the Shoah.